As we continue our essentials, basically the basics of Christianity, we come this morning to a topic that so often most people are either dismissive in regard to or indifferent in regard to or even regretfully accommodating in regard to. I'm talking about the topic of sin. You probably won't turn on your television on Sunday morning and see many preachers talking about sin. It's become somewhat out of vogue. But Paul said, I was determined to know nothing among you save Jesus Christ and Him crucified and to preach the whole counsel of God. And when we go back to these basic principles of Christianity, these essentials that we need to know, we have to deal with the topic of sin. Now, as to the enormity of sin, sin is misunderstood at best and disregarded at worst. Some have seen sin for what it really is and some have not. Actually, many have not. Benjamin Franklin once said, sin is not hurtful because it is forbidden. It is forbidden because it is hurtful. C.S. Lewis said, we have a strange illusion that mere time cancels sin. But mere time does nothing either to the fact or to the guilt of sin. Mae West, that vixen of old, said, It ain't no sin if you crack a few laws now and then, just as long as you don't break any. Billy Joel has a song that says, I'd rather laugh with the sinners than cry with the saints. The sinners are much more fun. Well, I would say that... Miss West and Mr. Joel have a completely different idea about sin than Mr. Franklin and Mr. Lewis. But sin is often misunderstood. This morning's lesson, I hope, to at least pull us into the, where we get what the Bible says about sin. How God views sin and how we should come to that same place. First, we need the causality of sin. What caused sin? How did it get here? Sin actually originated with the devil. It was not brought into existence by God, but sin found its birth in the heart of a fallen angel. First John the third chapter, verse eight, says he that committeth sin is of the devil, for the devil sinneth from the beginning. For this purpose, the Son of God was manifested that he might destroy the works of the devil. Sin entered the world way back there in a place called Eden. Man became a sinner. Everybody knows the story about Adam and Eve and how they were in the garden and they were tempted by the devil. And I'll elaborate a little more on that in just a moment, but we know what happened. They rebelled in essence against God and partook of that tree of the knowledge of good and evil. They heard a lie, they believed a lie, and then they responded to a lie. The bottom line is they disobeyed God and in essence they rebelled. Sin, when sin came into the world, and we need to get this for sure, because people today look around the world and say, well, if there's really an all-powerful God and an all-knowing God, then why is there suffering in the world? Why is there sickness in the world? Why is there death in the world? And it's because they don't understand that when sin came in, and by the way, we let it in, that sin entered the world, it brought some friends. It brought death. Genesis 2 and verse 17, God said, but of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil you shall not eat, for in the day that you eat of it, you shall surely die. Sin brought death to man. Sin brought death to every living thing on the face of this planet. Sin brought death to an entire world. Romans 5 and verse 12 says, Wherefore, as by one man sin entered into the world, and by death sin, so death passed upon all men. For all have sinned. In Chapter 6 of that same book, verse 23, Paul would state clearly, for the wages of sin is death. But then, thank God, he would follow that, but the gift of God is eternal life 
through Jesus Christ our Lord. Paul would elaborate to that struggling church at Corinth in chapter 15 of that book, which, by the way, we're studying on Wednesday night, peak of the week. Everybody needs some peak in the week. Wednesday night, 7 o'clock. If you can't be here, at least join us online. But in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 56, he says, The sting of death is sin. So we need to understand that when sin came in, it did not come in alone. It brought with it friends. Sin's origin, when it comes to man, and if we go back to the garden, was set in place because we broke a law. God had given Adam and Eve everything. And I believe in my heart of hearts that Adam and Eve were perfect representations of mankind. Had you been Adam or had you been Eve, you would have done what they did in time. Maybe not as quickly, maybe quicker. But you would have done it. But God set in place one law. Don't eat of this one tree. The devil stepped into the scene, tempted those two individuals, and with the first recorded lie, said to them, you shall not surely die. You will be like God's. You'll be like God himself, knowing good and evil. Now, in that temptation that took place so long ago, and actually still takes place today in your life and in my life as we see sin confront us, tempt us on a daily basis, there were three elements to sin. There still are. First John, the second chapter, verses 15 through 17, John actually says to Christians who have been born of the water and of the Spirit, love not the world, neither the things that are in the world. If any man love the world, the love of the Father is not in him. For all that's in the world, the lust of the flesh and the lust of the eyes and the pride of life is not of the Father, but is of the world, and the world passes away, and the lust thereof, but he that doeth the will of God abideth forever. So John actually informs the church of the first century and the church of the 21st century there are three aspects to sin and the temptation to sin, and that is the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life. It's there in the temptation in the garden. When Eve saw that the tree was good for food, lust of the flesh. When she saw that it was pleasant to the eyes, lust of the eyes. When she saw that it was desired to make one wise, the pride of life, she partook. Sin broke into this world by virtue of man's doubt and man's lust. James, the first chapter, verses 13 through 15 says, Let no man say when he is tempted... I am tempted of God, for God cannot be tempted with evil, neither tempteth he any man. But every man is tempted when he is drawn away of his own lust and enticed. Then when lust hath conceived, it bringeth forth sin, and sin, when it is finished, bringeth forth death. We brought sin into the world. So let's not pass the buck to Adam and Eve because we're here and we're tempted and so often we still say okay and we partake sure it originated beyond this world in the realm of angels and fallen angels but we are the ones that let it into this world disobedience brought sin into the world Romans the second chapter verses 7 through 8 Paul said regarding those who are struggling to do God's will and those who are not, and he puts it this way, to them who by patient continuance and well-doing, they seek for glory and honor and immortality, their prize, eternal life. But unto them that are contentious and do not obey the truth, but obey unrighteousness, for them indignation and wrath. God commanded them, and when he told them, of all the trees of the garden you may eat, but of this one tree you cannot eat, he told them a truth. He also set a boundary to where man could exercise his free will. They did not obey that truth. They obeyed unrighteousness. And in Romans the sixth chapter, in verse 16, Paul would actually say, no you not, to whom ye yield yourselves servants to obey, 
his servants you are to whom you obey, whether of sin unto death or of obedience unto righteousness. In verse 12 of that same book in chapter 5, he says, Wherefore, as by one man sin entered into the world, and death by sin, so death passed upon all men, for all have sinned. So the causality of sin in the world was man. We are the ones that rebelled against the command of God way back there, but then still in our current present lives today. And though our sin may not consist of eating from a forbidden tree. It still consists today of disobeying. Now I want you to really think about it. When you think about sin and what it means, it's the creature. By our disobedience, shaking our sinful fist in the direction of the Creator, And saying, I'll do what I want to do. Now, that's the causality of sin. But second, we need to see the clarification of sin. What is sin really? And we're not going to go to Webster's Dictionary to get that definition. We're going to go to the Bible. We're actually going to go back to the Greek words. The first word that's used for sin is anonomia. It actually means lawlessness. It means to break or to violate God's law, it is a disregard of the word or the law of God. 1 John, the third chapter, verse 4 says, Whosoever commits sin commits lawlessness, for sin is lawlessness. And again, it's illustrated with Adam and Eve. Some have argued why alter the destiny of a world on such a trivial matter as eating an apple. Well, there's a couple of things wrong with the question. First, the Bible doesn't say that it was an apple. It says it was fruit, Genesis 3 and verse 3. It could have been a banana for all I know. Second, the eating of the forbidden fruit was not a trivial matter. The very purpose of the forbidden fruit, the forbidden tree, was twofold. One, it had to do with self-control. Man was created with a free will. He had to learn how to control that free will. And then it also reflects our loyalty to God. Man demonstrated their lack of loyalty to God, their trust in God, their belief in God's word when they partook of the fruit. So what is sin? I don't believe what you said. I don't believe your law. And it is the breaking of God's law, the setting aside of God's law. The second word that's used for sin is peritoma. It means overstepping the law, a false step, a blunder, trespassing, the Lord's Prayer, forgive us this day our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. It's actually a violation of another person's domain. David actually would use this word to describe his sin with Bathsheba and the killing of her husband. In Psalms the 51st chapter, in verse 3, when he actually lamented that sin that he had committed so long ago, he said, For I acknowledge my transgressions and my sin is always before me. When David committed adultery, he violated another man's domain. He trespassed against not only that man, but also God. When David had Uriah killed her husband, he placed himself in the seat of God. For only God has the right to kill. Sin trespasses into another domain. Into another's domain. So what is sin? It's trespassing. Stepping across the boundary line that God has actually set in place and forbidden. And if you still don't get it, let me just... uh, Listen, you go down to Homestead Air Force Base and you climb a fence that says restricted area, U.S. government, no trespassing You'll find out what trespassing means real quick. So, sin is a transgression. It is a trespassing. But also, there's another word used, missing the mark. Now, the Greek word there is homatia. It means missing the mark, missing the bullseye. It's a failure to meet a divine standard. In Romans 3 and verse 23, Paul would say, For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. They've missed the mark. All of us have missed the mark. In Matthew, the fifth chapter, Jesus says, This is the mark. In verse 48, Therefore be ye perfect, just as your Father in heaven 
is perfect. Jesus was saying, there's the bullseye. There's the mark. And when we sin, we miss the mark. Now, let me give you a few examples of those three words that are used for sin. Lawlessness, anonymia, to break or violate God's law. To be in disregard of the word of God or the law of God. In Matthew, the seventh chapter, in verses 21 through 23. Very, very important scripture. Jesus actually says in the Sermon on the Mount, Not everyone that saith unto me, Lord, Lord, shall enter into the kingdom of heaven, but he that doeth the will of my Father which is in heaven. Many will say to me in that day, Lord, Lord, have we not prophesied in thy name, and in thy name cast out devils, and in thy name done many wonderful works? And then I will profess unto them, I never knew you. Depart from me, ye who work iniquity. Now that's King James. I grew up with it embedded in there. Sorry, guys. You got to get the these and the thous with me, all right? But in the New American Standard and the English Standard Version, they take that word, anonomia, and they translate it, Depart from me, ye who work lawlessness. They didn't abide by the law of God. These poor people, this hasn't happened yet. It's going to happen. According to Jesus, in that day, many will say, Hey, we believed in you. We did lots of good stuff in your name. But they didn't go by the law of Christ. They had never done. He says, I never do you. They had never done what they needed to do to be saved. Someone told them, you've done what you needed to do to be saved. You said a sinner's prayer. You invited Jesus into your heart as your personal Savior. But that's not in the Bible. They disregarded the law of God. They didn't dig deep enough to find out what does it say I need to do to be saved. And Jesus will say to them, I never knew you. You never ever became my children. You may have done all of these things, but you practiced lawlessness by not going to the book. Then there's transgression. David, Uriah, and Bathsheba, he stepped into another's domain. Peter, when he denied the Lord, it was that false step. He crossed a boundary. And then missing a mark, I struggled. What can I use as a, an illustration? It's missing the mark. It's like a, a bowman with a bow and arrow. And I used to have a bow and arrow. And I'd practice by aiming at that bullseye on the target. And it's our missing the bullseye. Maybe even missing the whole target. Every instance within the pages of the New Testament, when the Bible uses the term forgiveness or remission of sins, every single instance, nine instances in the New Testament, every time that phrase is used, remission of sin, it is this word that's used before it. The remission of sin. The missing of the mark on Acts 2 and verse 38. When 3,000 people cried out, men and brethren, what shall we do? We've crucified our long-awaited Messiah. What shall we do? Peter said, repent. And be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, for the remission of sin. And it's this word, harmatia, the missing of the mark. You've missed the mark. You've crucified your own Messiah. All sin is not the same. I've, I've heard people actually say, uh, sin is sin. It's all the same. Well, you're right and you're wrong because all sins are still an offense to God. But not all sins are the same. We get that. Just common sense. But Jesus clarifies it for us easily even while on trial before Pilate. In John 19, in verses 6 through 11, when the chief priests, therefore, and the officers saw him, they cried out, saying, Crucify him! Crucify him! Pilate saith unto them, Take ye him and crucify him, for I find no fault in him. The Jews answered, We have a law, and by our law he ought to die, because he made himself the Son of God. When Pilate therefore heard that saying, he was the more afraid. And went again into the judgment hall and saith unto Jesus, Whence art thou? But Jesus gave him no answer. Then Pilate saith unto him, Speakest thou not unto me? Knowest thou not that I have the power to crucify thee or to release thee? Jesus answered 
Thou couldst have no power at all against me, except it were given you from above. Therefore he that delivered me unto thee hath the greater sin. You see, the Jews saw him do the things he did. They saw him open the eyes of the blind. They saw him open the eyes of one who was born blind. They saw him raise a man from the dead who had been in the tomb for four days. They witnessed it. They heard his words. No one ever spoke like this man. He spoke as one who had authority and not as the scribes and the Pharisees. They saw that. And they still delivered it to Pilate. Pilate didn't have a clue who he was. And Jesus said, those that have delivered me unto you have committed the greater sin. It's common sense. It's common sense. Listen, lying about a surprise birthday party in order to keep the recipient of that birthday party from knowing there's going to be a birthday party is completely different than killing someone because they upset you and cut you off in traffic. There's a huge difference between the two. One of them you go to jail and the other one you just told a lie to keep a party secret. I think God sort of gets that. But still, just figure out a way not to lie about the surprise birthday party. Sin is the lifting up of the wrong will. It's what it boils down to. When you talk about the clarification of sin, it's the lifting up of your will and my will against the will of God. We are actually saying to God, my wants, my will, my way, not yours. Third thing we need to see in regard to sin is the characteristics of sin. We need to understand that sin first is selfish. The chief principle of sin is selfishness. The chief principle of love is selflessness. At the heart of sin is me, myself, I. Sin is not only selfish, it's also enticing and deceitful. Sin actually is deceitful. We don't always even see it coming. It takes us by surprise. Proverbs 1 and verse 10 says, My son, if sinners entice thee, consent thou not. James 1, verse 13 and 14, Let no man say when he is tempted, I am tempted of God, for God cannot be tempted with evil, neither tempteth he any man. But every man is tempted when he is drawn away of his own lust and enticed. I don't know who said this, but I think it's absolutely right. Sow a thought and reap an act. Sow an act and reap a habit. Sow a habit. Reap a character, sow a character, and reap a destiny. And I believe that's right. It starts in our own mind. It's enticing. It's deceitful. And if we give it place, it will come in to our lives. Hebrews 3 and verse 13 says, Exhort one another daily. He's writing to Hebrew Christians. Exhort one another daily while it is called today, lest any of you be hardened through the deceitfulness of sin. How many times have you heard someone say, well, we just love each other and it's got to be okay because we love each other. There's a deceitfulness there. There's a deceiving of the person. But sin is also enslaving. Sin enslaves us. It binds us up. In John the 8th chapter, in verse 36, Jesus said, If the Son therefore shall make you free, you shall be free indeed. But what's preceded that statement? Verses 31 through 36. Then Jesus said to those Jews which believed on him, If you continue in my word, then you are to my disciples indeed. And you shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you free. They answered him, We be Abraham's seed. We have never been in bondage to any man. How sayest thou, You shall be made free? Jesus answered them, Verily, verily, I say unto you, Whosoever committeth sin is the servant of sin. And the servant abideth not in the house forever, but the son abideth forever. If the son therefore shall make you free, you shall be free indeed. Amen. Those Jews were thinking about captive to another, captive to another nation. They had forgot about Babylon. They had forgot about their Assyrian captivity. They were altogether mistaken when they said, we have never been in bondage to anyone. You forgot about Egypt for crying out loud. But despite those errors, Jesus said, if you do what I say, then you'll be set free. And sin is the prison, is the captor. Romans the sixth chapter, verses five through seven. 
if we have been planted together in the likeness of his death. He's talking about being baptized into Christ. We shall also be in the likeness of his resurrection. If you don't believe baptism is important, ask the question, why did he say, for if we have been planted in the likeness of his death, we shall also be in the likeness of his resurrection. Knowing this, that in that act of baptism, when you are buried with Christ in baptism, that's verses 1 through 4. When that happens, something amazing happens, whether we know it or whether we do not. He says, knowing this, that our old man is crucified with him, that the body of sin might be destroyed, that henceforth we should not serve sin. For he that is dead is free from sin. When we came to Christ, we died to ourselves. We said, I will die. I will take up my cross and die to myself, follow you daily. And when we are baptized into Christ, we are buried with him by baptism into Christ. And when we're raised, we're raised free from sin. We often don't even know it. Only God can set us free. We are the subjects of an evil taskmaster called sin. Let me tell you something. If I were to ask one of you to come up here and I had a chair and I thought about doing this, but I knew this sermon was a little long. Don't get clock-eyed. Anyway, I thought I'd have a chair here and I'd get a big spool of thread and I'd ask you to sit down and I'd put one or two strands around you and then tell you to get up and you'd get up and you'd break that thread with no problems. But if you sat here long enough, if you let me... And I wrap thread around thread around thread. At some point, you would not be able to get up. Sin is exactly like that. We may think, I got control of this. I can handle this. And if we leave it there long enough, it will enslave us. It will imprison us. But sin is also progressive. Most often, it goes from bad to worse. 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 13 says, But evil men and seducers shall wax worse and worse, deceiving and being deceived. Let me tell you something. People can become hardened in sin. 1 Timothy 4 and verse 2 speaks about those who have their conscience seared as with a hot iron. And, and I, I pray, I hope, this morning as I prayed before I came here, praying for you and praying for me that I would present God's word adequately. When I prayed, I, I prayed that none of us would be so hardened that we couldn't hear these words from God because our conscience can become seared. We don't see it anymore, but used to be in the days of old, there were blacksmiths everywhere. And a blacksmith would work with that metal and do all kinds of different things uh, when it comes to plows and, and, and tools and instruments and horseshoes and all of this stuff. And he got to where he handled that hot iron that was in that furnace glowing so much, his hands would become seared. They would become calloused. And he could pick up a piece of iron that would burn you and me if we grabbed it. When I was a young man, I think I've shared this with y'all before. I made donuts. One of my first jobs was at a donut place. I'd get up at 2 o'clock in the morning and that commercial was out there with the guy locking the little steps going, I'm going to go make the donuts. I'd go to the donut place and we'd mix up the dough and we'd put it in the thing to rise. And then when it came time to cook it, I would drop them in a whole tray at a time and I got 10 pounds, 15 pounds heavier with that job. But anyway, uh, I had a stick and the grease was 375 degrees and you'd hit the donuts. When they got done on one side, you'd hit them and they'd flip over and you'd do the other side. That's why you got the little line in between the glazed donuts. And then you'd glaze them in the whole tray and like I said, I gained 10 pounds, 15 pounds with that job. But one morning I couldn't find my stick and the donuts were in and they were cooking and I can't find my stick and I'm like, what do I do? And so my hands were clean. I washed my hands before I cooked. So I reached down and I started turning them with my fingers. Well, that grease was still getting on my fingers. And then I forgot the next night, I don't know where the stick is. And I did it again. And I did it for like a week because I'm a procrastinator. And I didn't go to the store to buy a stick. After a week, my fingers got so tough, so callous, so seared that I could do it all the time like that. And it was faster than the stick. So I just kept doing it like that. Our conscience can become seared if we continue in sin, if we keep playing with it, touching it, going around. It can sear our conscience. In Romans, the first chapter, Paul speaks of those that God, because of their disobedience, because of their rebellion, because they're not willing to come to God, because they want to engage in crazy lifestyles, much similar to the lifestyles that we see advertised today. In Romans, the first chapter, the Bible says God gave them up 
to uncleanliness. God gave them up to vile affections. God gave them over to a reprobate mind. What does that tell us? That if you persist long enough, persistent, flagrant disregard of God, disregard of His Word, disregard of His law, there may come a time when God gives you up. God gives you up. God gives you over. You want a life of sin? God will say, have at it. And see where it takes you. Sin is selfish. It's enticing. It's enslaving. And it's progressive. The next thing we need to know about sin, the consequences of sin. Sin separates us from God. If you remember, Adam and Eve had a relationship with God to where God would come in the cool of the day and walk with them in the garden. They had an up-close personal relationship. Can you imagine walking with God in the garden and talking with the creator of all the universe? Go home and look at Hubble Telescope pictures of all the galaxies that are out there. Imagine walking with that being who spoke a universe into existence, power that you cannot even come close to imagining. They walked with him, but when they sinned, the daily walks stopped. Sin takes us away from God. Sin separates us from our peace. The first instance of worry in the Bible is in Eden. When they sinned, their eyes were open. They realized that they were naked, and so they, they sewed fig leaves together as aprons so they could hide their nakedness, and they were worried when God would come that day and they were lacking peace that sin produced an enmity with God an enmity robs us of our peace if you go and you want to live a life of sin unless you're drunk or on drugs I got a feeling you're not going to sleep very good at night unless you completely lose your faith that God is there the prodigal son left his father he ended up in a pigsty. And all he knew was, I'm dying here. But my father, even his servants have enough to eat. And he had enough sense to come home. Peter, after his denying Christ, his peace was stolen. The Bible says he went out and wept bitterly. Judas, after he betrayed Christ, once he saw that Jesus was condemned, he became guilt-ridden. But he didn't understand that God could have forgiven him. He had a worldly sorrow that brings forth death. And he went and he threw the money back at those who had paid him to betray Jesus. And because his guilt was great and his sorrow was worldly, he went out and hung himself. David, after his sin with Bathsheba, again, Psalms 51, 3 and 4, For I acknowledge my transgressions, my sin is ever before me against thee. And the only have I sinned and done this evil in thy sight. He had sinned against Uriah. He had sinned against Bathsheba. He had sinned against Israel. But the bottom line is he had sinned against God. Ultimately, finally, he had sinned against God and he recognized that. And Psalms 51, let me tell you, is the most beautiful psalm in the world when you are guilty of sin. Verses 7 through 12, he says, Purge me with hyssop and I shall be clean. Wash me, and I shall be whiter than snow. Make me to hear joy and gladness, the bones which thou hast broken, that they may rejoice. Hide thy face from my sins, and blot out mine iniquities. Create in me a clean heart, O God, and renew a right spirit within me. Cast me not away from thy presence, and take not thy Holy Spirit from me. Restore Unto me, the joy of my salvation and uphold me with your free spirit. That is a prayer. That is a prayer to give me my peace again. Because my sin has robbed me of it. Sin brings, also brings in suffering. Adam and Eve became a part of a broken world. Sufferings came through the door with sin, Genesis 3, 16, unto the woman, he said, I will greatly multiply thy sorrow and thy conception in sorrow. Thou shalt bring forth children. 
To Adam he would say, Cursed is the ground for thy sake, and sorrow thou shalt eat of it all the days of thy life. Thorns also and thistles shall it bring forth unto thee, and thou shalt eat of the herb of the field. In the sweat of thy face thou shalt eat bread till thou return to the ground. Sin brings suffering. Sin also brings death. The reason there is a grave in your future, and don't forget that. The Bible says, teach us to number our days. There's a grave waiting on you if Jesus tarries and you do not see the second coming of Christ while living on this earth. The wages of sin. Romans 6.23, the wages of sin is death. And it's a divine declaration. Ezekiel 18 and verse 4 says, Behold, all souls are mine. The soul of the Father as well as the soul of the Son are mine. The soul who sins shall die. John 3 and verse 16, the most famous verse in the Bible, says, For God so loved the world that whosoever believes in Him should not perish but have everlasting life. The word perish there comes from apolemy. It means to destroy ultimately. To be destroyed. Whosoever believes in the Son of God shall not perish, not be destroyed utterly. In Matthew the 10th chapter verse 28, Jesus said, Do not fear those who kill the body and are not able to kill the soul, but rather fear Him who is able to destroy both soul and body in hell. Sin brings death. Here and on the other side. We need to understand the enormity of sin. This is where I think we really miss it. Because it's just so easy. It's just so easy because we see it everywhere. Every time you turn that TV on. Every time you turn on that radio. Somewhere in the midst. I used to listen to country music. I love country music. Sorry from the south. I like it. But so much of it is about sin itself. Sin will separate you from God. Dr. J.H. Jowett said, I covet." No phraseology that lends respectability to sin. The source injury we can do a man is to lighten his conception of the enormity of sin. We need to turn on the TV and see that is exactly what's happening today. We are minimizing what is called sin. R.G. Lee says, sin is the most hideous and hellish thing in God's universe. We don't see it that way. We in some way have made it a natural thing in life. It's just what we do. I can't tell you how many Christians that are dismissive when it comes to sin. They say, ah, we're all going to sin. I don't think that's the goal. At least not when I read the New Testament. Now, trying to explain the enormity to sin is probably one of the most difficult jobs that I have as a minister. Sin's not about a little white lie. It's not about eating a small piece of fruit. Sin is about rebelling against the creator of all the universe. And I promise you, I promise you every heartache, every tear, every pain, every hurt, every regret, every trouble, every argument, every broken life, every broken heart, every broken dream, every broken aspiration, all somehow are connected to sin. Somehow, some way, they're all connected to sin. Now, finally, the cure for sin. Boy, I'm glad we got that point in here. I'd, I'd go away pretty depressed today if I had to stop right here. But there's a cure for sin. God's cure for sin is blood. Romans 3, verse 23, the wages of sin is death. That sacrificial system that God put in place way back there, I don't know if you realize it, but when Adam and Eve sinned, God the fig leaves won't do. He clothed them with animal skins. And the Hebrew actually means animal skins that went all the way down to the feet. Animals had to die. Blood, the innocent blood of animals was shed to cover them in their sin. Now, God set up a sacrificial system. Not because he was bloodthirsty. But because God was trying to teach Israel and by virtue of that teach us and then foreshadow something else. The seriousness of sin. The innocent has to die because of your sin. The magnitude of your sin is such that for justice to be satisfied, 
that which is innocent must die. And you may say, well, it sounds like God's bloodthirsty. That animal sacrificial system was in place to let them know the seriousness of sin, but to foreshadow the Lamb of God. When John the Baptist saw Jesus coming to him to be baptized, he said, behold, the Lamb of God, God's sacrifice. It's as if God said, here is my sacrifice for all of you. I'm going to give you something that can take away your sin forever. Not just for a year and then the next year. And the next year as the Jewish sacrificial system was put in place. I'm going to give you my son. This is the Lamb of God. And he sacrificed his son on that cross to take away your sins. The innocent for the guilty. We are set free. Because of what he did at Calvary. He takes our sins. And what's amazing is God imputes his perfect, righteous, sinless life. God imputes that life to you and to me. He gives it to us. That's amazing grace. And we'll never get it. Tozer put it this way. We can never know the enormity of our sin. Neither is it necessary that we should what we can know is that where sin abounded, grace did much more abound. Romans 5 and verse 20. To abound in sin, that is the worst and the most we could or can do. The word abound defines the limits of our finite abilities. And although we feel our iniquities rise over us like a mountain, the mountain nevertheless has definable boundaries. It is so large, so high, it weighs only this certain amount and no more. But who shall define the limitless grace of God? It's much more plunges our thoughts into infinitude and confounds them there. All thanks be to God for His grace abounding. He's referencing that passage for where sin abounded grace did much more about. It's not in the outline. But Romans the 8th chapter says we are more than conquerors through him who loved us and gave himself for us. When you go to heaven it will not be by the skin of your teeth you will be get granted an abundant entrance if you have come to realize what sin really is and run from it, trying to disobey the dictates of sin and obey the dictates of God. Let me tell you something. The only way that God can sweep sin aside by virtue of His holiness, His righteousness, and His justice, the only way He can sweep it aside is to sweep it under the cross. That's it. That's the only way. Man became a sinner by hearing a lie. By believing a lie. By responding to a lie. Man becomes free of sin. By hearing the truth. Believing the truth. And responding to the truth. Jesus said to those Jews which believed on him. If you continue in my word. Then you are my disciples indeed. And you shall know the truth. And the truth shall make you free. If you're here this morning and you're not free of sin, maybe you've never become a Christian. You can believe that Jesus is the Son of God. You can repent of your sins. You can confess Christ before men this day. And you can be buried with Him in baptism, raised to walk in that newness of life, dying to your sin, and being raised to walk in a brand new life, being set free from sin. If you've done that, but maybe the deceptiveness of sin has pulled you back in, you can change today. You're still on this side of eternity. Your heart still beats. You still breathe to make changes while you can.